Our reading today is still in 1 Corinthians. It will be chapter 2 this time, verses 10 through 15. And the purpose that Paul has in mind in his writing to the Corinthians is to establish not only the church, but unify the church, because there was great division at that time. This particular uh, reading will be the true wisdom of God. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything in the depths of God. For what human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit that is within? So also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the Spirit of God known only by God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. Those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God's Spirit, for they are foolishness to them, and they are unable to understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. Those who are spiritually discerned all things, and they are themselves subject to no one else's scrutiny or deep study. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. just want to pray before we continue our time together in worship through preaching and teaching of God's Word. Heavenly Father, we are here again because of your kindnesses, because of your great mercy over us. Even in this very moment, we're borrowing breath until you decide to take it back from us and bring us home to you in glory. In this moment, Father, we're just asking of you, as the body of Christ, that you would Open our hearts to receive your word with gladness. Help us to understand the realities of true wisdom. Help us to understand how to build our lives as we sang about, to be built on the foundation of Christ. And God, would you just help us uh, to eliminate distraction. In this moment, Father, I pray that nothing would hinder your word from being clearly understood and for Christ to be clearly exalted as he might, as he should. Um, and Father, we're just so thankful that we get these opportunities to, to spend time in your word together. We love you. We pray all these things in your precious son, Jesus' name. And the church says, amen. Amen. Well, we are going to be continuing in our series, No One Lacking. Uh, if you're new, we just started this series last week, and it is a series through the letter of uh, First Corinthians, and we really want to be very intentional as we go through every one of the sermons that we that we have an emphasis in the work and person of the Holy Spirit. It's very important because many times uh, we talked about this last week, but the Holy Spirit, um, we might pray um, or highlight the, the Holy Spirit. Um, but he's uh, almost considered really the, the forgotten God. Um, uh, very rarely are we relying or depending on his strength. And we have to be very careful to make sure that we don't just communicate about the Holy Spirit as in it, but as who? He. Him. He is a who. <laughs> he's, he's the third person of the Godhead. He, he is God. And all that God wants to accomplish within the life of the church is going to happen through his power. If you want to know the word of God, you want to understand the revelation that's been given to us, it happens because of the spirit of truth. And so this is what Jesus identifies the Holy Spirit uh, to be, or at least one of his purposes, is to make known to those who don't know the, the truth of Scripture, but also but to convict the world of sin and to make us aware of righteousness. And so if you need a Bible, you can raise your hand and somebody is coming down. Somebody from our club team is coming down to give you a Bible. If you don't have one at home, you can keep that one. That's our gift to you. 
We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And by way of introduction, I want to just set the stage here for us to, to really just consider a reality that we live in. We're living in a time right now where there are millions and millions of resources in libraries at our disposal. I know that many of us maybe don't, probably don't spend much time in libraries. The only time I'm in the library, by the way, is when I'm doing story time with the kids. Um, and so there's, there's cool things that happen for the little ones there. But the fact is, there's a lot of information at our disposal. Yes? But maybe the reason why many of us don't spend that much time in libraries is because we got the Internet. And so we have access to phones, and we've got iPhones and the Internet and Androids, whatever those are. Um, and, and we have information whenever we, want it, whenever we want it instantaneously. Not only that, but there's also a new reality that is happening in our culture, and it's a technology that we, we, we have called AI, artificial intelligence. And it's to the point now where you can really ask AI, whatever engine you choose to use, certain questions, and you're going to get some scary, accurate answers. When AI was first introduced, maybe to the public, it, they had to shut it down because everyone was accessing its servers and trying to figure out how to do all kinds of crazy things, how to rob the bank of this and what are the, what are the uh, you know, blind spots of this uh, government agency and all that. And they're like, okay, we got to close this thing down because AI has actually given them some pretty good ideas of how to, how to harm others very strange that we created something like this, but at the core of it is our desire to, to have the information that we need when we want it and to not have to do so much work in getting it. It's really an acknowledgement that we have to make for ourselves that we're finite. We, we have the internet, we have libraries, we have books, but we still recognize and don't believe in our minds that we're going to somehow know everything at some point in this lifetime. You know that you're limited. No matter how much information you try to take on, that you're still not going to know everything you desire to know. Yes? And so it really doesn't matter how much access you have, although it's a good thing to have access to information. I can, when I'm doing Bible study and I'm preparing for a sermon, I open up an app called Logos. I can click on a word. It gives me the Greek. It gives me the Hebrew. I can see what other uh, pastors in the past have wrote, written about it. I can see what commentators and scholars have said about a particular text. I have a lot of information at my disposal that back in the day people didn't have. But what's the point of the information if we don't know what to appropriately do with the information? Just because you know a lot of stuff, it doesn't make you why. Wisdom is something that's very different than just intelligence. In fact, the scriptures let us, let us know that, that the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. And if, you, if we need to communicate that in layman's terms, it's the first place to start in recognizing the most important thing you need to recognize is that you're a created being. And that there is someone out there who has designed the things that you see and engage in. And so it'd be good to get to know them. It'd be good to acknowledge that you do not have all access to all information at your disposal as much as we try to pursue that. Uh, God says in, in Scripture, where were you when I created the foundations of the earth? When I put the stars in place? when the creatures began to swarm around in the waters. Where were you? I didn't consult with you. I didn't ask you for some thoughts. Hey, guys, what do you think? I'm thinking about making um, the universe, and I'm just, just you know, what, 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 what are some colors you think I should put out there? No, God, in his own good pleasure, decided that he was going to create beings and create a world that was going to be the recipient of his love. That's ultimately why we're here. The problem is we're living in a time where everyone thinks that they know something, 
And based on what they believe or what they think they or, or what they what they think they know, we begin to we begin to uh, uh, treat people differently based on certain levels of information we know about them. We we begin to act differently based on what we think we know what we think is true about ourselves. And God needs uh, God's desire for us is to recognize, and we talked about this last week, that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. That there is neither Greek or Jew, slave or free, male or female, but what Christ accomplished on the cross was he destroyed the dividing wall of hostility. Therefore, there is not one person in this room, I don't care where you came from and what you've done, you've never done anything worthy of the grace that's now available to you. It's a gift. But now we're seeing here in this letter, as we mentioned last week, Chloe, one of the sisters in the church, one of the prominent women in the church, is telling Paul, hey, we need you to get some straightening done because there's a lot of division happening here. And so Chloe writes a letter, sends it to Paul. Paul actually writes a very stern letter to the Corinthians. We don't know where that letter is. Chapter 6 let us know, lets us know that he wrote something previously. And so we mentioned that 1 Corinthians is technically really 2 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians is technically 3rd. But we won't really get into that. The point is, man, for people that have, been, that have received the revelation of Jesus Christ, who have received the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God, the invitation into his glory, into relationship, to be in right, perfect relationship with God again because of the work of Jesus, they're divided. And so this letter here is to address that. And he begins with addressing the, 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 the division. The last thing we talked about was how he doesn't need, Paul, to approach anyone with eloquent wisdom or wisdom from the world. He, he doesn't need to try to come off as uh, wiser than someone else or to sound articulate. He's just going to resolve to know nothing except for Christ and him crucified. Paul is like, the only thing that you need to know right now is Jesus. And I don't want to do anything to get you to be impressed by whatever it is that you might see. Otherwise, the cross will be emptied of its power. And so I don't want anyone to be impressed with us. I just want to impress upon you what Christ has done. Now, that's not a prescription to begin to act like you don't know anything in false humility. He's just making a point that what you need to be most focused on is not, is not the person, but the the, uh, the, person, the messenger, but the one that has sent the messenger and the message itself. Verse 6, we do, however, speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. And so what Paul is saying here is, okay, I know I said it's not about eloquent speech and, and things like that, but I actually do have some wise things to communicate. Okay, I, I am going to drop some wisdom on you, but, but here's the thing. I'm doing it among the mature. Let me stop there. Because who are the mature? Because he's giving this, he's writing this letter, letter to the church, but then he's addressing an aspect of their immaturity. Well, in this particular context, and you'll see us unpack this later on, this particular context, the mature are those who have accepted the message. Okay? So it's not addressing right now the, the behavior of the believers in this particular moment. He's saying that the message of wisdom has been spoken over amongst the mature. And, and they've received it. If you have recognized Jesus as your Savior, you are among the mature. Okay? Now, we're going to unpack that a little bit. Because this wisdom is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. The first thing we have to establish is that any kind of wisdom that you uh, claim to have or desire to have, the true wisdom that's worth anything is that which has to be revealed to you outside of you. The wisdom that you need is not a wisdom that can come from anyone of this age or any of the rulers of this age. The people that were leading at that time, the Jews particularly, 
they thought they had wisdom because of their knowledge. They can quote scripture like the back of their hand. They understood what the Torah communicated. They spent time in the synagogues. They can quote everything back over to you, but Jesus says that they honor me with their lips, but their, their hearts are far from me. The kingdom of God is not a matter of your intelligence. If you want to have wisdom, you have to go to the creator of all things. And any kind of wisdom that you might think you have found in this life outside of God is coming to nothing. Verse 7, on the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom that God predestined before the ages for our glory. Uh-oh, here goes a scary word for many, for many folks. What is he saying when he says predestined? What, 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 what really does that mean? Well, the word is simple. It's determined beforehand, okay? Pre- to predestine something is to determine before it happens. Yes? Are we good so far? No tomatoes yet? Okay. We're speaking of wisdom that, uh, we speak of God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom, hi- uh, a wisdom of God predestined before the ages for our glory. The wisdom that Paul is addressing, and he said, and he's communicated this and revealed this to us in some other letters, but he's talking about the work of Christ on the cross for the sake of sinners. He's talking about the gospel. The, the gospel is the clearest um, explanation and demonstration of the wisdom of God. What Jesus does and making the two one, he does that in infinite wisdom in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way that was revealed very up frontly, but unable to be discerned, okay? There are many things that God has already displayed, but because of our inability to discern them without the Spirit, some things are right in front of you and you can't quite see it yet. You know, in the Old Testament, there are passages of Scripture where God has, yes, He has had an elect people. It was the Israelites. By the way, what is an Israelite? God just chose a pagan man, Abraham, and decided to create a create descendants from him. It's not like they were born a particular way. It was just, i got to start somewhere. Okay, I'm starting with you, and your family line is now going to be the Israelites. Okay? These are going to be the people of God, the chosen people of God. But one of the things that is very important about their descendants being many, and as, as, as much as you can count the stars, so you can count the descendants of Abraham, here's the thing. Their purpose is to be a light to the nations. What's the point of being a light to the nations if there is no desire to reach the nations to invite them into the family of God? This is Old Testament teaching. When we read it in the New Testament, it seems like it's some new thing. It might be, re- it might be clarified. And, and what Jesus does is he brings understanding to the things of old. So the fact that there were Israelites, there were people of God that chose to reject others from other nations was actually contradictory to their very existence and their purpose. They began to have a pride about themselves. And so it's so debased that even at a point of, um, uh, there's a story that we read about where Jesus is walking around the temple and you know this, there are signs outside of the temple courts, and there are some people that are not Jews that are told, if you're a Gentile, you're just as good as dead if you cross this threshold. There's, there's, there's some, there's some uh, 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 um, sinful things taking place, there's, uh, there's selling that's going on, but it's not just that thing, people are selling within the temple, but it's the fact that people are being taken advantage of, because if you're a person that does not have resource, but you're marking up certain animals that they can't afford, they got to now try to pay you with other things, and there's is an injustice taking place to the poor and to the Gentiles. So when Jesus is angry and he begins to um, throw tables, you know what he says? He says that you guys have turned my father's house into a den of robbers. But he says that this place is supposed to be a house of worship for 
all nations. We gloss over that. Part of his anger is that there are people who are actually not just uninvited, but are kept from being able to enter into the presence of God. Kept from being able to worship and to be able to get to know the God that this chosen people were the ones chosen particularly to be a light to those who are far from him. And so this is what, this is what God has always been revealing the whole time. He's going to choose a people so that he can call all people to himself. This is what the plan has always been. And so, this was predetermined before the ages for our glory. What's the point of making all these different people who come from different backgrounds and cultures if, our, if God's desire is not to show himself through them? And so, verse 8, none of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom, because if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Wow. Wow. The sign that these folks who knew their word, who were zealous for the glory of God, the sign that they had no idea what they were talking about this whole time is the crucifixion of Jesus. I mean, even Jesus has to pray. They know not what they're doing. This is fascinating, guys, that you can have something right in front of you and have no idea that it's there. It, 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 your eyes can be open, but you see nothing. You, you, you've read the passages. Ever, see, ever seeing, but not perceiving. Hearing, but not understanding. This is what, this is what the, the scriptures are, are highlighting, that, 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 that we have to make sure that there's a humility that recognizes. Because all, all this is is hardened hearts. God can do miraculous, wondrous things in front of you, and we addressed this last week. It's not going to bring about the, the necessary change if we're unwilling to surrender ourselves to it. And so none of the rulers of this age knew it, knew this wisdom, because they, if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived, God has prepared these things for those who love him. And now, maybe if you've read this passage, you, you might assume that this is particularly talking about heaven. It's like, oh, guys, I'm just telling you, when you get there, it's like no eyes, no heart has ever conceived. And just, I'm telling you. And sure, I mean, it is true that no eye has seen and no ear has, has heard and heart be able to con- you know, conceive these things. But the context that he's using this passage from um, Isaiah 64 is really talking about what God was doing this whole time. Again, it's right in front of them, but they're not seeing the, the working of redemption taking place with the coming of the Messiah and Christ revealing himself as the Savior it, to where he has the boldness because it's true. He says, he said, show me the Father and that's all that I need. Show me God, that's all I need. If you, if you see me, you've seen the Father. He communicates and lets the his people, the followers know that I am the way, the truth, and the life. His disciples are still stuck in some of the misinterpretations of what they knew. And so every once in a while, even though Jesus is communicating truth to them, they have to, they're having to get clarity. And Jesus says, you still don't understand these things? Okay, all right, let me, let me help you. Let me help you. You get to the resurrection of Jesus. He kind of disguises himself, and he's listening to disciples walking and talking, and, and he begins to engage with them. And it's interesting. Everything that has happened, he said it was going to happen, and yet there's still debates happening even post his, his uh, uh, resurrection. So Jesus reveals himself you know, to all the, uh, of his disciples at that moment, and their mind is blown. You, what you already said is actually has been happening this whole time, but we, for whatever reason, had no ability to perceive it in the moment. God has revealed these things to us, how? By the Spirit. Since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God, for no one, uh, for who knows a person's thoughts except his Spirit within him. This is so good because look at the person next to you. 
The person you came here with. I know you think you know them. I mean, you don't know them. I mean, you know them, but do you know them? Do you know every thought that comes to their mind? Are you aware of every feeling that they have felt? Are, are, you, are you totally sure you know exactly how the person that's next to you or your spouse or your children, whatever, you know every detail about what they think about you or what their thoughts are? You don't. Who can know? Who can know the depths of an individual except for that individual themselves? You have all kinds of thoughts that you probably either don't want anybody to hear or maybe you would like some people to hear some of these things, but maybe there's fear in sharing them. Whatever the case may be, the point is no one else knows you the way you know yourself. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except for the Spirit of God. Now, we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who comes from God so that we may be able to uh, understand what He has, what has been freely given to us by God. So, the Spirit that we have now received, this means that this was outside of us. Yes? That That God had to send Him. And he's made his dwelling place within the believer. He, he, we, we've had to receive him. And not only do we need him for, for the enablement of the ministry that we're called to, to serve God and his kingdom, but also to understand the things of God. We also speak these things not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. And so, and so the, the challenge with our world is the way we want to explain everything is with whatever information that we can find on AI, that GPT, type it in, okay, what is this? And then boom, here goes the response. But if you need to understand the thoughts of God, God has to reveal it to you. And the way he chooses to do that is through his spirit. And yet, He's the most ignored person in the Godhead. This is why I'm saying no one, no, no one lacking, because no one has to lack. Not only do we have the Spirit, but we have one another. But we have community that we can engage in to help us make sure that we understand what it is that God wants for us. Because Paul even says, I, I know in part, but then I will know fully. When is then? Then is when he returns. That means even if you're incredibly gifted, you, maybe you have an incredible gift of, of prophecy, or there's some things that you believe God is clearly revealing to you through the Holy Spirit. Okay, cool, but you know that you're also fallible. So, so maybe God did show you some things, but your interpretation of that is, in, is inaccurate because God will never reveal something that's not, that has not already been revealed in His Word. Yes? Scripture God's Spirit cannot contradict what God has said because He is the Spirit of truth. And so, the Spirit helps us understand and helps us explain the things of God to spiritual people. But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit because it is foolishness to him, and he is not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. So, so there it is, guys. The reason why there's rejection of God is not because of a lack of information. It's a condition. The Holy Spirit is the illuminator, as we prayed earlier, that, that you would illuminate our hearts to understand. That there's, a, there's, a, there's a deadness that leads to a rejection of beautiful truths that seem to be foolishness. And so... Oftentimes, again, we've talked about this, but when you are reaching someone or you want to share the gospel with an individual, your feeling is that I've got to get better at my speech. Uh, I've got to get better at my apologetics. Uh, Let me go read a book that's going to help me answer hard questions. Do all of those things. That's totally fine. It's good to work on your articulation of some things. It is good to try to make sure that you're prepared to give an answer for the faith that you have. But the reality is, 
your intelligence, just like Paul says about his own, is not what brings anyone to the kingdom. It's not what ushers folks in. It's a miraculous thing that takes place. Man, I haven't seen miracles in a long time. What, 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 how come God isn't working miracles the way he did before? If you're saved, that's a miracle. He has brought you from death to life. He has transferred, me, transferred you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And you're saying, Where, where's the miracles? This is a room full of miracles. And so, if a person is rejecting, what we ought to do is pray that the Spirit of God would reveal himself to them so that they can understand what's being communicated. Spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything, verse 15, and yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. What he's saying there is, is, is the other way around. Listen, it, the Spirit of God enables us to be able to rightly see what's happening through his word, but someone without the Spirit can't make a judgment on you. How? How can someone without the Spirit of God begin to engage with you about morality? They have no basis of the morality that is revealed to us through Scripture. It's not about just doing good things and finding out that there's a Christian who sometimes does not do great things. It's about if you're going to call, if you're going to hold me accountable, you're probably trying to keep me accountable on a basis of things that are in this world, not from the Word of God. And whatever we're going to do as believers, as disciples, as followers of Jesus, is we're going to base our um, life on the things that Christ has revealed. And so sometimes that might mean that we have to, we went off track, but we have gone off track from God's word, not out of someone's, a, a cultural, a, a cultural uh, um, determination of what's right and what's wrong. We're going with faces to scripture, asking God, what do you have for me? Community of people saying, hey, I need you to understand this. Hey, sister, you're not walking in your identity. This is a matter of who we are. When, when you're talking to somebody else who may not have the Holy Spirit, you can't call them to something they don't have the capacity to do. That's just behavior modification. But when you're talking to a son, a daughter, you, you're actually inviting them into something that they actually have the capacity to do because of the Spirit that's within them. Uh, do we fail? Do we have weaknesses? Absolutely. Sanctification oftentimes is a slow process. Sanctification is being made holy. As we're growing and maturing, that takes, a, that takes some time. That takes process. And so you don't just get saved and all of a sudden you have zero. All of the challenges that you had are just out the window. You, you, you've got to grow in your dependency on God in order to mature and be more like Jesus. And so you can't be evaluated by someone without the Holy Spirit as it pertains to your life and godliness. Because they don't have the wisdom that is necessary to be able to communicate what's, what's right and what's wrong. The spiritual person, however, can, uh, can evaluate everything. He, he can't be evaluated by anyone. For who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And so for my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual. Now, he went from set, highlighting that the mature are those who receive the, the word. Now he gets into this reality that he cannot speak to them as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babes in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not ready for it. In fact, you're still not ready. Can you have a worldly believer? Yes. This is proof of it. I can't, I can't even address you as spiritual, but as people of the flesh. He's not writing to just whoever he thinks he hopes will just read and embrace the truths of Scripture. He's writing to a church. He called them saints. You remember that? And so now he's saying, I got a problem now. So he's now bringing some, he loves this church. He loves these people. He's the one that helped plant this church. And now it's time for some truth and love. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not ready for it. Sometimes you want someone to be able to, to go to the next. This is not about graduating from the gospel. You, you'll never graduate from the gospel. That is your greatest truth. We are anchored in the reality of what Christ has done on our behalf. But there are other things that we can be called into as we 
mature and grow in our walk with Jesus, but sometimes we're just not ready for it. Sometimes we lack the spiritual maturity to, to, to get to the next step that we ought to, to go from being a, con, a consumer to a contributor because we have hindered uh, our sanctification process through our lack of surrender to the Holy Spirit, and which hinders our maturity, which makes us not as useful as we could be in the kingdom. Most likely, anybody that is struggling to mature spiritually is probably, and we talked about this, not connected in community. And here, there is a community problem because there's a division problem. And if there's division in a church, people aren't growing. And so he has to address this. He says, I want to give you solid food, but you, you weren't ready for it. Because you're still worldly. For since there is envy and strife among you, it, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? You, you've been given the ability to navigate differently th than the world. But yet, if we put your life next to some other people's life that don't have the Spirit, it's hard to tell a difference. Paul is concerned here. Because he gave them the word of truth. He spent time with them. They have the Holy Spirit, but they're not taking advantage of what's available to them as a gift. So they're fighting, and they're causing division amongst one another. Factions are taking place. Because whenever somebody says, I belong to Paul, and another one, I belong to Apollos, aren't you acting like mere humans? Look at what he says here in verse 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Here it is. They are servants through whom you believe, and each has the role the Lord has given them. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth so that neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Look, look at this. Now the one who plants and the one who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. You guys are fighting about who, what side you're on. Okay, I, I'm on Paul's side. I'm on uh, Peter's side. I'm on Apollo's side. While you're dividing on whose side you're in, they're one. That's why earlier last week, he asked the question, is Christ divided? You claim to follow Christ, but... We're supposed to be the body of Christ. So how is the body divided? It wouldn't make any sense. You wouldn't take parts of the body and begin to try to individualize yourself from the rest. Your functionality would be hindered. Your fruitfulness is hindered. You might even die. This is the significance of unity. It's not just the fact that I don't like to see people fighting. It's a matter of life and death. Notice he says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believe. It doesn't matter the position, the role, the status. What these guys are, it's not even who they are, it's what they are is instrumental. Instruments that, I mean, imagine you're getting ready to set up that new dresser um, like I have that has taken 30 years just to get done um, to the point where you just give up and want to throw the thing away. But by the time you were done building it, the, you've already passed your return policy. You know what I'm talking about. When, when, when the instruction manual looks like a Bible, you know what I'm talking about. Imagine if I end up grabbing a screwdriver or a wrench, and one of those tools say, hey, uh, actually, um, use me for, for something else. I'm not really trying to turn anything right now. Just, can you use me for, for, for stirring some food? How are you going to tell me, instrument, how you're supposed to be used? I, I imagine a screwdriver telling the, the, the person that's using it the best way for it to be utilized. You are there to just exist, to be used in accordance with the one who has you in their hand. And so as instruments through whom you believe, what is Paul? <laughs> what is Apollos? Stop elevating us. Don't worship the mailman. Worship the one who sent him. And 
So he says, I, I planted, I, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Neither one who plants, the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. No one who plants and, uh, now he who plants and he who waters are one. Each one is going to receive his own reward. I'm going to do my best to, 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 to serve faithfully in the space that God has called me to serve in, to not make a ministry out of the critique of another's lack of whatever you think they should be doing. The question is, what are you called to? And are you being faithful? Does that mean you can't challenge a brother or sister, that you can't bring them into alignment? Absolutely. But when you try to separate yourself and make it, a, you know, you think about when, when uh, Peter's trying to ask, what is Jesus going to do with John? They're, in, they're on the beach. This is the, the, uh, the resurrected Jesus. And Peter says, so what's going what's gonna to happen with John? <laughs> Go on, tell me, what's your plan with him? Because I know you got kind of close. And he says, listen, if I choose to keep him alive until I return, what is that to you? Like, what does that have to do with you? This is the reason why he, he chooses not to communicate the days and the hours. Is this, is this the time where you're going to uh, uh, um, restore the kingdom of Israel? It is not for you to know the time that the Father has set. That's really what he's saying. He's saying, he's not saying, well, I, well I, I'm just, I tried to ask the Father, but he's driven right now. Let's ask me next week. He's saying it's not your business. Be concerned about the things that you can be involved in that God has called you into for the purpose of his glory and his kingdom. You know why? Because, verse 9, we are God's co-workers. You are God's seal, God's building. God has invited us into a, a role in which we get to be participants in the redemptive plan of God. Like Paul is saying, we're co-workers with God. Like we, we've all clocked in through the Holy Spirit, and we actually all have a responsibility to play a part in the glory of God being, uh, being manifest and, and spread throughout the nation. Co-workers with God, partners with him in ministry. Now, none of us are going to sit there and say, well, I, uh, Lord, just a couple of things. I'd just like to sit down with you and just talk through our plan, our strategy of, uh, you know, of how we're going to reach this place. We're going to see here why the workers aren't necessarily telling, that's us, by the way, the, 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 the person that has deployed us into ministry what he should be doing or what we ought to be doing. We're instruments, Yes. We're not going to tell the person that has this in his hand what to do. Look at this. According to the grace that's been given to, to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder. And another builds on it. But each one is to be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay a foundation other than what has been laid. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. Here's a question for us to wrestle with, guys. As a co-worker in the kingdom of God, how are you building? No, 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 no. But we're all building something. We're all, we're all, if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, here's the question. Because he, Paul asks us, or, 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 or is telling us, be careful then how you build. How are you building? What are the materials that you're using to establish this building, this, this, this kingdom, to help establish this kingdom that God has sent us out into the world to do? How are you building? For no one can lay a foundation other than the one that's been laid. That foundation is Jesus. If anyone builds on that foundation with, here it is, Here's some material. Gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw. Each one's work will become obvious. Do you see something here? He starts off with gold, silver, costly stones. These are materials that are not easily destroyed, yes? If you had to choose out of all the, the, the items here, you're, you're not going to choose, okay, let me get some straw, let me get some hay, uh, 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 you know, some, some wood. 
Maybe you would, but that means you just haven't listened or watched Three Little Pigs. You just ain't, you just ain't watched that. You didn't get groomed well enough at home. I'm sorry. No, we know that if we are going to build something, we want to use the best material we can. We want to make sure that we use tools and material that we have confidence is going to last. He said, each one's work is going to become obvious. Whatever you use to build it, it will be obvious at some point. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test the quality of each one's work. It's going to test it. Are we talking about literal fire? Not necessarily. It's just that at, at the end, I mean, even now, there are some things that we've done. I mean, think about even your faith. What is it built on? Because if it's, if it's just seed that falls on rocky soil, the moment one little thing happens, it chokes the seed and proves itself to not have been legitimate in the first place. You, you need something that you're building to be able to get beat up a little bit. And this is what God does within us. He he, he, in our sanctification, in us being made more like Christ, that includes some suffering. That includes some going through some things. It's not just, I'm going to be just like Jesus, exactly how he is, but I'm never going to walk as he did. Sometimes we, 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 we make walking as Jesus did synonymous to just all of the cool things that we read about. Like anyone would, I mean, who would not want to go around healing people, uh, folks be appreciating the, prof- the profundity of his messages. But what about the suffering? What about the enduring through persecution? What about the injustice? How, how, what happens when we have to go, actually go through something? It will reveal the strength of what we've been doing this whole time and what we've, what we've had, how we've been building, how we have ourselves been built. So the work will disclose it. It'll be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If, anyone work, if anyone's work has been, uh, if anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burnt up, he will experience loss. Let me just speak to this for a moment here. This is not a matter of salvation here. That if your work was built on weak material, your, your, the, the way you lived your life, the way that you spent your time, talents, and treasure, if it was building things that, were, that, that are so temporal that it couldn't bear the weight of reality, of life, or the fire of judgment, It says he will experience loss. He himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So it's not talking about loss of salvation. Let's be very clear, because don't forget, it's not a matter of what you're building and how well you built that got you into the kingdom. You're you're being called to build some things and to use what God has given you because you already are in the kingdom. But man, have you ever been in those scenarios where you kind of just, you, you, you made it just by the hairs of your tinny chin chin? <laughs> like imagine if I know what my job description is or I know what my responsibility is at home or I know what my um, you know, call is to be a father or whatever the case may be and all I'll do is just the absolute, I'm just going to provide. Bare minimum. It's like, there's a difference between just being present in the home because you're physically there and actually being really present in the lives of of people, in the lives of your children. I remember my my wife, actually, and I can say this because I know that we ain't in the room and you won't be listening, but, you know, (laughs) I ain't trying to get beat up, guys. I got some some things I need him to purchase, and so I'm going to be very careful here how I communicate this, but... There hasn't really been relationship. Some of that is cultural. So let's be fair. I, I want to be gracious here. But um, sometimes we feel like the best thing that I'm here to do right now, like you know how hard I work. We left our previous country to come over here. 
and I'm just going to devote myself to working and grinding hard so that you can have a better life. The reason why you were able to be in sports, the reason why you were able to, uh, to have shoes and clothing and all of that get into college was because of the hard work that I had to do to make sure that I... And that's a good, can we just, that's a good thing, yes? It's a noble thing to care and to do the necessary things, to work hard, to provide. But when you are in your deathbed, and you're looking at your children and your children's children, your grandkids now, and you're looking and you're saying, wow. And maybe you left a nice lump sum of money behind. Hey, but just so you know, there's there's 1.7 million in the bank. Listen, I know I haven't been around, but this is what I've been trying to save up and store up for you, and I'm hoping that incredible things will happen. Hopefully, they'll use that and do good things with it. But they never knew me. What's the real legacy? Let, let's just say, as long as the children live, they, they do some good things. You set them up well, but if they never had relationship with you, they don't have any memories of some lessons you've taught them. They don't have any memory of when they got in trouble because, they, you know, they, they veered away from the principles that you were trying to establish in their lives. We can acknowledge that they worked hard. That's not what we're talking about here. I honor that. But what I'm saying is, ultimately, at the end of the day, what is it that we're trying to build with? What, what significant things are we doing that have eternal implications? Or not even, forget about significant. I want to just rephrase that. What are we doing that has eternal spiritual implications? And that we're intentionally working towards that. And when I say by the hairs of our chinny chin chin, it's like, yeah, you, you, you were a parent. You parented. Or, yes, you showed up. You did what you're supposed to do. And then you walked out. Yes. You know, you, you, you told your wife you loved her every because you know she likes to hear words of affirmation. And so you said, I love you. Remember? Hey, remember. I love you, right? Okay, good. All right, I did my duty. No time spent. No just trying to discover who she is. No trying to engage in the things that interest her. Or maybe the other way around. It's like, hey, um, I need that check. Uh, have you I, go, go to work. No, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. But I don't really need you to hear about what you have going on. Just get, make sure this house is taken care of. Whatever. To me, that's that kind of bare minimum lifestyle. That God doesn't want us to live like that. It's not enough, or uh, it, it, it certainly is good to, to 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 know that you are in the kingdom of God. But man, what what joy will it be to just look forward to the like you've made some sacrifices while you were here, and you know that God does not forget that. You've sacrificed time. You've sacrificed treasure. You've sacrificed um, talents. There's some things that pe- that you've been doing that no one will ever know you did it. There's some things that you have engaged in that that folks will will not may never acknowledge. Your chil- there's the sacrifices you made for your children that they'll never know about. But we but we recognize God knows. The spouse may never recognize the full depths of your service to the family. God knows. The church may never know all of the ways that you've been engaged in ministry or just behind the scenes in your community. God knows. Knowing that God knows should give us incredible rest. This is how we avoid burnout. Because because we, we, we know that God knows what we're doing, so I don't have to say yes to that event, to that gathering, to that meeting, to that opportunity because of the fear of being judged or looking like I'm not caring or looking like I'm not being productive. I I can say no to these things because I've said yes to all the right things. If I know that I've been productive with my time and I've been stewarding what God has given me and using costly stones and, 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 and the right kind of equipment to build my life, then I can say no to the things that are necessary to say no to because I'm saying yes to the right thing. And I know that God knows. Sometimes we might be seen while we serve, but we don't serve to be seen. We serve with the hope that Jesus will be more clearly seen through us. And this is what John the Baptist, this is, this is what made him feel like he completed his purpose. Jesus comes and John the Baptist's ministry, we talked about this, is dwindling. And he, and he looks at that as a, 
as a as mission accomplished. This is where he says, he must become greater, I must become less. I, I want people to see the groom. I'm not trying to get in the way in the wedding and and you know, listen, this is about the bride and the groom coming together, not the best man coming in and hey guys, did you like, did you like my decorations? <laughs> yeah, that was me, that was me. If you don't just move out of the way. And that's what John John the Baptist excused himself so that Jesus can have all the attention and all the glory. Fire is going to test each of our works. And we're going to have to we're going to have to ask ourselves how we build. Don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that God's uh, that the spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy. We're going to talk more about what this really means next week. But here's what I want us to realize for this morning. Paul says, don't you know that you are God's temple? So he says that we are God's field, God's building. God has chosen for his people to be the dwelling place of his spirit. That's what this means. When it says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, you are the residing place of the Spirit of God. This is where he decide, he delights to dwell in. And if he's in you, then there is something that should be produced out of the reality or the result of, his, of, of your union with him. There's a way in which things should look in light of the fact that he's living inside of you. And he says, if anyone destroys God's temple, God's going to destroy him for God's temple is holy. And that is actually what you are. So now it's not just that you are holy in the sense of you're blameless and you have no sin. We talked last week. Are you blameless? Yes. But are you blameless? No. (laughs) But you're covered by the blood of Christ. For those of us who believe, and you have forgiveness of sins, past, present, and future, there is no fear of how you stand when you stand before God. You can stand in confidence, but you're also set apart for His purposes. And so hopefully when we look at our calendars, guys, when we look at our weeks, when we look at our goals, hopefully we recognize that we are not our own, and there is a way in which we ought to be utilizing our time, our talents, our treasures, how we're building our life, the material that we're the material that we're using, but even the foundation that we're laying. You can't lay a foundation other than the one that's already been laid, that is Jesus Christ. He's the only purpose that we have for our existence. He is the one that we want to point people to with our lives. And so if you the question of what significant thing have you been doing to make deposits into eternity? Well, did you did you have some time with the Lord this week? Um, that counts. Did you help a neighbor move because you, you, you saw them and you realized, ah, that person's not going to, it's going to take this person three hours. If I come over there and help them out real quick, we can knock this thing out in 30 minutes. That counts. Did you help feed the homeless? That counts. Uh, did you counsel someone or share some hard things? That counts. Did you have to confess sin, that counts. Did you repent about something today? That counts. These are things that we we don't want to limit how we're building to what's happening on Sunday morning. You know, if you ask people that question, it's like, man, can't you just ask me, you know, make sure you ask me on a Sunday so I can identify, okay, I volunteered to serve this week. So, okay, yeah, I did plug team. Yes, I did. Um, I was on a parking lot today and the, no, the question is, what do you do when we gather, when we scatter from here? How are you living? The things that are easily seen, things that are unseen, the things that you know that God knows, whether we see it or not. How are you building? And recognize that everything you're doing for His glory, the sacrifices that you're making, they, they all count, and God will remember them. When you get to see Him face to face, it's not going to be ah. Oh, Man, I should have never gave all that time, or I should have never, you know, been that generous. I should have never been that concerned about my neighbors and cared about other people the way I did. Gosh, I should have been a little bit more selfish. 
man, I should have been a little bit more. That, that won't be your posture. In fact, you'll get that good, well done, good and faithful servant. Not because you did something to earn his salvation. His salvation Again, it is a gift. Saved by grace through faith so that no one can boast. Yes? No one can boast before the Father. But there are some things in light of our salvation that we can operate from that really makes his beauty and his work most evident in this world. And so let's pray, God. Father, we're so thankful that we have the opportunity to, to be co-workers with you in the kingdom. God, we know that you are um, incredibly gracious and kind to us and that you have given us the very things that we have to use to build a life that's going to point to you. We want to lay not a new foundation, but to lay what has already been laid, and that is um, what Christ has accomplished on the cross on behalf of sinners. We want people to know the good news about Jesus. We want people to know that God recognizes that they have no ability to fix themselves in the brokenness that they may be experiencing in this world, and the only one who can is God, and he actually put on flesh. He dwelt among us, lived the perfect life that we could never live, so that anyone who would believe in him, that he actually died for our sins and resurrected on the third day, that God, that we would have life in his name. The work of God is to believe in the one he sent. And he sent Jesus, and so help us, God, to live lives that are pointing to him, getting out of the way so that no one's boasting in their own what, uh, uh, works, but we are boasting all the more in the work of Christ in our lives. We love you, Father. We pray all these things in Jesus' name.